welcome to Asia in Review at Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, I'm your host, Hong Jiang. With me in the studio are my guests, John Okutani and Derek Iwata from the Japanese Cultural Center of Hawaii. And we'll be talking about Japanese in Hawaii. For those of you who watched us last Tuesday, we talked about uh, Japanese, uh, sorry, Chinese in Hawaii. And uh, today we continue um, on our program to learn about the different Asian communities in Hawaii. And uh, today we'll be learning about uh, Japanese immigration, culture, and the people in Hawaii uh, with John Alkutani and Derek Iwata. And thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Thank you, thank for, you for having us. Um, <coughs> maybe uh, each of you can introduce yourself uh, just a little bit to our audience. Well, as uh, Hong mentioned, my name is uh, John Okutani, and I'm a volunteer uh, museum tour guide at the Japanese Culture Center of Hawaii. Um, the museum is called Okage Sama Day, which is I am what I am because of you, and it, it deals with the Japanese immigration to Hawaii. So I'm a museum tour guide there. Great. And Derek? Um, my name is Derek Iwata. I'm the Education Specialist at the Japanese Cultural Center. Um, kind of in charge of the group tours, mostly at elementary school students uh, from public and private schools. But we also do take tours from Japan, as well as um, from the U.S. mainland. And also help with our programs department, doing different programs. Um, that's great. At the end of our program, we'll, we'll come back to the Japanese Cultural Center. And um, so um, let's start from the current state of a Japanese in Hawaii. Uh, first, in terms of numbers, how many are there? Oh, is there a way to tell how many Japanese are there in Hawaii? I think, um, I guess you have to go back to the 2010 census to look at that. Although, uh, I'm not too sure, you know, a lot of the classifications are different than from before. And, uh, Asian Americans, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders, I mean, that's another classification, but uh, Roughly, I think uh, the percentage is about 23 percent the Japanese out of 1.3 million here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So that would come up about uh, 300,000 300, something. 10,000. Yeah. yeah, somewhere mm -hmm. out there. But then uh, that also includes uh, um, people who are mixed because, as you know, Hawaii is very multi-ethnic, and uh, a lot of, uh, in fact, a lot of people who come through the uh, Japanese Culture Center, a lot of them are not pure Japanese but a mixture and you know we have a lot of uh, different uh, ethnic groups and all combined so I'm not too sure that figure is a very solid figure as far as you know the number of uh, ja only Japanese uh, people in Hawaii that live here but 23 percent I think if you look at the peak to the immigration uh, roughly the um, peak was about estimated 43 percent of the population from, from the time the immigrants first came here. That uh, was back when? Back uh, in uh, probably 1940s, you know, 30s, wow. in that time. that was but, a not uh, large number. But again, the makeup of Hawaii, you know, is very different in terms of ethnic groups and so forth, of, as compared to today. You know. um, <coughs> talk a little bit about the um, kind of origin of uh, the uh, Japanese descent here in Hawaii and uh, also their relationships you know, relationships between people coming from different areas in Japan. In terms of today, you talk uh, about? Uh, first talk about the origin, where they came from. Most of the Japanese immigrants uh, came from <clears throat> the southern part of uh, Honshu, the main island uh, of Japan and Kyushu, mainly uh, Hiroshima Prefecture, Yamaguchi Prefecture, and uh, Fukuoka and uh, Kumamoto, and also uh, Okinawa also. And these were the main uh, groups that came came from Japan. I think uh, if you um, study and look at the history, you know, in terms of uh, what happened in Japan, for example, in 1868, and, uh, when Meiji took over from the old Tokugawa government, which was a very feudalistic government, and um, Meiji represented the, the modernization time, and this was in, back in 1868, um, <clears throat> a lot of the uh, a uh, result of the restoration, a lot of the um, people who are, are, were involved with the restoration came from those areas, Yamaguchi came, and at that time it was named uh, Choshu and Satsuma, which was uh, that part of the island. So as a result, as these people uh, changed over the government and started to modernize, a lot of these people 
uh, from that area became, uh, you know, the ministers and so forth, and they were active in the government. And uh, so uh, the, I believe the tendency was to have, uh, to release a lot of the economic pressure from that area to send to Hawaii mm -hmm. to work in the plantations. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll get to talk about uh, more of the, the uh, Japanese immigration just right. a little later. Uh, one thing that um, I found out in uh, among the different kind of groups of the Chinese, Japanese, uh, Filipinos, um, mm. uh, a lot of people come here to Hawaii and they still identify pretty much with their origin. They are not just from Japan, they're from this particular area of Japan. For example, uh, for example there are these uh, Okinawan fest festivals. Um, and uh, clearly people who s still very much identify with the origin of their immigration. Uh, would that, is that the case for the Japanese immigrant, immigrants here after this uh, uh, long time that have passed? Well, again, if you look at uh, when eight, from 1885 when the first immigrants come, came and until now you're looking at five generations basically. So a lot of that uh, continuity has uh, been sort of stretched and uh, I wouldn't say it's broken but you know it's been diluted based on organization but again Derek can talk to as far as some of the cultural things that we still kind of retain here you know in the islands as far as a connection you know, uh, that you're talking the about connection to back to the Jap Japan, Japan, Japan. To Japan yeah. okay uh, yeah we'll, you know, we'll address that uh, just in terms of the relationship between the different Japanese immigrant groups <laughs> Uh, coming here to Hawaii, whether uh, you know, can you detest, uh, detect any difference, uh, conflicts in terms of the, the relationships among the Japanese immigrants? Oh, are they all identifying themselves just as Japanese immigrants? And what about the differences within? Well, I mean, I think I don't think there's. Um, I mean, we've become so multi-ethnic here. I mean. It, it's hard for us to just identify with one group, you know, basically, because, I mean, a lot of the, um, I guess you would call us more identification as being local as opposed to being from Japan or Korea or China and so forth. And mm -hmm. in that local sense, it's a local Hawaiian identity is what you're, we're looking at. That's here. interesting. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, we've, we've come so far over 125 years that uh, uh, the melding of this, uh, groups you know become uh, i think a little bit more um prominent and if you look you know further generations down they be, be become more because i think most of the um, like the students if they go to the uh, u.s and they ask them where they come from i mean before if you, were, you came from japan but now it's well i'm hawaii you know from hawaii mm -hmm. you identify with the hawaiian uh quote uh, culture or local culture uh, can each of you speak a little bit about your own family immigration history? When did they come and, and then different generations? And just share a little bit about your personal story. Well, for me, um, my grandparents on my mother's side, you know, came in the 1890s or so. And uh, uh, they came, of course, here to, to work in the sugar uh, plantations. And then my, on my father's side my grandparents uh, came from came in about 1902 down around that time and uh, they also worked in the plantations initially but again um, you know we have to look at the immigration periods and I guess we'll talk about that later but mm -hmm. essentially um, they came during that time eight, late uh, 1800s and early 1900s and uh, elected to stay here because not all of them elected to stay here a lot of them fulfilled their contracts and they went back to Japan and uh, I haven't seen any precise figures, but I'm thinking you're roughly about maybe 40% stayed here. And then, uh, of course, some, you know, some died, died out, and uh, uh, a lot of them moved on to other places or went back to Japan. Yeah. Uh, Derek, how about you? Um, for myself, uh, I'm what we consider a yonze, or fourth generation Japanese. And so it was um, my grandparents' parents, my great-grandparents, were the ones that came here to Hawaii. Um, for for my family, both of my mom's side and my dad's side, they all came from Hiroshima, and um, so you know the question earlier about do we do I relate back to like the people from Hiroshima? Not really. It's more of I'm just Japanese, or even just as as John mentioned earlier, just a local. Um, 
I'm, I'm not good as John with dates. <laughs> I don't know when they actually <laughs> came, but um, I do know that they they were the ones that came here to Hawaii. I see. What about uh, language uh, maintenance? Uh, do do any of you speak Japanese? Uh, interested in uh, learning <laughs> Japanese language? <laughs> well, um, I can understand more than I can speak, uh, mm-hmm. but. I didn't learn it at home. I actually had to go to school um, to, to learn the language. Uh, first, uh, in elementary school, I took a couple classes in Japanese language school, and then continued intermediate in high school and to college. Um, and so that's how I picked up my language. I, I don't use it as often as I maybe should. That's like I can understand what I speak. <laughs> uh, have you visited Japan? Uh, I have once, um, mm-hmm. and I think it was 2010. Okay. Um, did it feel like a uh, home or related to home or, or is it just a, another foreign line, a foreign place? It was it was an, an interesting experience because um, they they do look like you know family members because they're all Japanese but um, I learned very quickly don't say anything in Japanese because <laughs> then you think I'm one of them and they they just go off and I'm like I have no idea what you said so oh, just okay English is better and <laughs> that's just right. say, yeah, I'm just visiting yeah, yeah. right <laughs> uh, for me about uh, you. as far as uh, Japanese language skills uh, I think it's uh, zero because uh, I'm third generation and uh, basically when I was growing up uh, in our household my, my parents were Nisei or second generation and they only spoke English and I I didn't go to Japanese schools like Derek did, you know, and I think um, that's one of the biggest um, barriers, I would say, in, in establishing any uh, connectivity for me back to Japan, because if I go there, or I've been there actually, but I have no communication skills, so if you can't communicate, it's very hard to uh, connect, you that's know, true. and yeah. establish that. Anyway, all you know is that if you meet somebody who who is maybe a distant relative, just by blood you're associated, but culturally and uh, in, in the language and everything else, they're very different, mm-hmm. very different. And uh, it's um, <clears throat> eye-opening because, you know, there's differences that you notice that you think like American, but when you get there, I mean, we look the same, but their thinking is very different. It's because how they were raised in Japan, you know, it's very, very different. So, so in a way that it's hard to identify with the, the Japanese in Japan, but in Hawaii, you identify yourselves uh, yes. as Japanese. Yeah, well, I do. But it yeah, sense, yeah, I think that's true. Uh, do you see the contradiction there, which is an interesting one, that uh, you have to identify yourselves as Japanese outside of Japan, but not connected with Japan in a way, right? Well, again, culturally, we're American, so yeah, it that's would be different, you know. Okay, okay. Yeah. Wow, that, that's interesting, uh, talking about uh, you know, immigration and all the cultural changes that have happened. Um, and, and toward the end of the program, we'll, we'll come back to talk about this cultural aspect, um, just uh, to look at how uh, the Japanese uh, Americans in Hawaii mm-hmm. maintain your culture through the different kind of festivals and uh, different events. Um, but um, just uh, in terms of, uh, I know John, you're talking about uh, doing the cultural tour at mm-hmm. the museum. Mm-hmm. Uh, is the tour, just briefly, is the tour about uh, uh, Japanese immigration history here in Hawaii or is it related to Japanese culture in general? Uh, Japanese immigration in Hawaii. Okay, primary. so basically <coughs> we're talking yeah. about local experience there. Right. Yeah. Um, so um, we're going to uh, take a, a short break here. Um, and uh, this is Asia in Review. And um, uh, we are discussing Japanese in Hawaii. And uh, when we come back, we'll have more of the story. Aloha, this is Jay Fidel. You know, uh, Think Tech and the Hawaii Venture Capital Association put on monthly luncheon panel programs at the Plaza Club here in Pioneer Plaza. 
Our program this time is on September 26th. It's called Solar in Hawaii. We're going to examine the solar industry and see what's in it for the long haul. Uh, we have a great panel, great moderator. Uh, we'll be sending out email on this. If you want to be in our email list to receive the details, uh, check out thinktechhawaii.com. In any event, you can sign up for the program at hvca.org. Thanks. See you there. This is Jay Fidel. Mahalo. We want to thank our underwriters, Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle and Cook Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashem. See you next time. Hello, uh, we're back. We're live. This is Asia in Review at ThinkTech Hawaii. And uh, we've been speaking with uh, John Okutani and Derek uh, Tawa, Aitawa about uh, Japanese in Hawaii, uh, learning about uh, Japanese immigration, history, and people. Um, okay, so let's start from the beginning. When did the Japanese first get here? And uh, you talk a little bit about what brought them here in terms of changes in Japan. Yeah. Well, when you look at uh, Japanese immigration to Hawaii, I mean, there's uh, actually uh, the main wave came in 1885, but in uh, 1868, uh, during the, uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, Meiji takeover from uh, Tokugawa, there was one ship that was scheduled to come to Hawaii uh, <coughs> to work on the plantations that was approved by the uh, Tokugawa government to leave and to come to Hawaii. But when Meiji took over, the ship was still in Japan, and they were waiting approval from the new government to, to sh um, ship out, but they didn't get the approval and uh, there was an American who uh, was in charge of the ship and he decided to just go, so he left without the permission, but he came to Hawaii with about 145 souls and uh, <clears throat> they came to Hawaii and a lot of these people were not, they were merchants or ex-samurai, they weren't farmers per se, and so when they came here and uh, uh, went to work for the plantations, it was very, very difficult for them. And the, the contracts were not very uh, solid in terms of uh, supporting the uh, laborers. So there were a lot of complaints. So they made a lot of complaints to the Japanese government. And then the Japanese government investigated and then uh, worked in agreement with the um, Hawaiian government to, uh, if these people wanted to go back to Japan, they could. And so uh, a lot of them uh, left Japan, but still a lot of them stayed in Hawaii. But after that, uh, the new government decided in Japan decided uh, to stop immigrating, uh, emigrating uh, people out to uh, foreign lands until they establish uh, diplomatic relations with the new, you know, governments. But they found that uh, they were very at a disadvantage, uh, being a new government and so forth, and having no uh, diplomatic ties per se. So they stopped the uh, immigration until. Uh, 1885. Was that before that uh, King Kalakaua uh, visited Japan? Uh, he visited Japan in 1881. Okay. So he was kind of a, a groundbreaker in terms of uh, establishing back the relationships with uh, the Japanese government uh, from the Hawaiian Kingdom. Uh, because uh, at that time, uh, and if you look back in the history, uh, in 1876, uh, the Hawaiian government had a treaty with the uh, U.S. government uh, which allowed them to uh, import uh, export the sugar to the U.S. Uh, duty-free. So that created a lot of demand and uh, they needed laborers uh, to, to work the fields. And uh, uh, King Kalakawa thought that the Japanese were sort of like, um, I want to say, uh, related you know, to the Hawaiians in that sense, connected to the Hawaiians. So, so he went on his road tour and then he established uh, diplomatic relations or relations with Japan. And eventually in 1885, uh, they, uh, February, 
they allowed this first ship to, to leave Japan to work uh, on the plantations. And this ship uh, contained about uh, roughly about 930 souls on it, uh, the first ship. <coughs> and um, it's interesting to note that, um, first of all, the economic um, realities in the, in the countryside in Japan, you know, they're uh, working for our on the average, you know, relatively about two, two, two or three dollars a month, and uh, the um, plantations were offering them fifteen dollars a month as as the payment. Uh, that was um, <clears throat> so. That was a very big economic so, incentive. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, so the from, plantations yeah. paid them more money to right. come here to work. Right to work there, but then uh, uh, and a lot of things happened with the changeover of the government. So you know, new taxes and all that. So out in the countryside, they were. Uh, very, they were feeling that uh, economic pinch, but uh, so 900 on the first ship, but they, they received over 28,000 applications to go. But that tells you the kind of the, you know, what was going on in the country in Japan at that time. And so the first ship, uh, again, February 1885, was the first wave that uh, came through. And um, when you look at immigration uh, for, from Japan to Hawaii, it, it's generally in uh, three phases. And a lot of the phases are driven by uh, uh, government or institutional policy changes. But the first period from 1885 to uh, 1900 essentially was they called a contract period, where these people would go on contracts uh, to work on the plantations. And uh, the contracts were based on this uh, Masters and Servants Act that the Hawaiian Kingdom passed, which in effect uh, legalized uh, the plantations to have a total control over these laborers. I mean, it's not uh, to a point of slavery, but it's a point of being an indentured labor. Because anything that the uh, um, laborers did that uh, insubordination or anything like that, they would uh, have the effect of law and police uh, police uh, to uh, arrest them or, or to get them. And uh, so they had no rights and no 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 striking rights or anything. But so again, this is under the Hawaiian so Kingdom. So so that that was the first stage of uh, the uh, immigration that you. Yeah, had that about? during the contract period. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that ran roughly again 1885 to 1900. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look back at the history again, uh, 1893 is when uh, <coughs> Queen uh, Liliuokalani was uh, overthrown, and then in 1998 uh, Hawaii was annexed by the U.S. So again, you see, this is all this governmental influence. And then in uh, 1900, the uh, U.S. passed this Organic Act, which meant that all the laws that pertain to uh, the U.S. applied to the uh, Hawaiian uh, territory. And that made the um, Masters and Service, Servants Act invalid because it was illegal under U.S. law. And so what, what that resulted in it was that uh, it freed up all, all the people on contract they were, they were uh, the contracts were null and void. So then a lot of the immigrants uh, either moved out into the community, some of them stayed, you know, to work for the plantations, but a lot of them moved out in the community and uh, there was a lot of uh, immigration uh, from Hawaii to the uh, mainland U.S. on the West Coast. Is that also the first time a lot of people returned to Japan? Uh, I have no uh, statistics on that, but uh, I'm pretty sure that there were some of them that did return to Japan. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, because you know they're not on the contract anymore, so they're essentially free to do what they wanted. But uh, so again, the fun, 1885 to 1900 was a contract period. 1900 to 1907 or 1908 around then was called the free immigration period. So there were no essentially no restrictions. You had people moving from <coughs> Japan to Hawaii, from Hawaii to the mainland. A lot of them staying in the mainland. My uh, again, my grandparents uh, on my father's side came during that period, uh, 1902. So during the free immigration period. And then you have a third wave, a third yeah, immigration well, wave. With all these people going to the mainland U.S., there's a very um, on the mainland West Coast, especially there was a very uh, strong feeling of anti-alien uh, uh, domination, what they call it, because a lot of these uh, Japanese and uh, were, were coming coming through to the mainland to work. And uh, there was a lot of um, uh, animosity because of the fact that uh, they were, you know, taking up jobs and so forth. And the, the, econ the economy and the, 
on the mainland was not uh, uh, too good. And then what really triggered it was that in California, they, they had a law where <clears throat> the Japanese children were to be segregated and taught you know, at separate schools. But mm -hmm. when, the, when the economy was good, all the um, um, school systems, they had room, so they allowed the Japanese children to, to go with the other children to school. But then the pressure got so great that uh, they, they were um, attempting to segregate these people, Japanese uh, kids. Uh, but in Hawaii, in there seems to be a much more kind of a, a, a yes. much better relationship right. between yeah. the Japanese and, and the, the rest of the society right. here, right? Although we still had, uh, you know, discrimination in a sense. Mm -hmm. But again, the Japanese uh, children were allowed to go to English schools. Mm -hmm. But then at that time in uh, California, it's not, um, you know, it's very, very fervent. So what was, what resulted in 1907 was a, a gentleman's agreement between Japan and the U.S. So it's, it's between the U.S. president and the Japanese government that uh, restricted immigration from Japan at that time. And only people who were been there previously or had uh, relationships with uh, other people they could bring them over to um, the U.S. I know um, I do some genealogy and a lot of my um, aunties and uncles came during that time because they were related to my grandfather. Oh, is that the period, that what you call picture brides uh, yes. period? Mm -hmm. uh. Because that, that's the other effect of mm -hmm. picture brides because uh, again if you're related you, you know you could legally come over. So let's so, backtrack a little bit. Um, were the Japanese immigrants mostly men in the beginning, and then they were needing wives, and then this is the period 1908, uh, starting from around then, that they were uh, uh, able to bring uh, the Japanese woman to yeah. marry, right? Well, initially during the contract period, 1885, uh, most of them were they're looking for young, able-bodied men, but yeah. we still had uh, married couples coming over also. Okay, okay. Yeah, as, as mm -hmm as opposed to the Chinese. I know the Chinese was strictly... That's married. right. They were only yeah. single men coming yeah. here uh, on the Chinese side. And of course, during the free immigration period, you know, 1900 to 1907, 1908, there were no, you know, a lot of women and uh, other folks came over. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, so that experience. really uh, is unique, uh, well, compared with the Japanese immigration, that the Japanese had to marry out a lot more often just because they were not allowed to bring their wives and here the and Japanese, the Chinese, were, allowed, yeah, yeah, the the Chinese were, weren't allowed to bring yeah. wives and the Japanese uh, had the family coming with them right. and al also were able to bring Japanese wives right. from Japan. Right. Yeah. And, and of course like you mentioned during the uh, restricted immigration period 1908 to 1924 I mean uh, about roughly about 20,000 Japanese picture brides came over mm -hmm. and that kind of uh, shifted the dynamic because you know if you have uh, single young you know individuals coming over initially and now you have a uh, picture prize and then more of a, a family and more stability you know, within their community because then the choice became uh, as they established the families you know should I send money home to my you know relatives at home or should I uh, keep my money here to raise my own children. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's right, yeah. Yes. In terms of work, so they came to the sugar plantation first. Yes. And um, at the time, there were Japanese, uh, the, the Chinese uh, immigrants already were there at the plantation, right? Right. What about, uh, anything you can say about the relationships between the Japanese and the Chinese, and later on with uh, the Portuguese um, immigrants here in Hawaii? Well, the, um, First of all, the plantations would segregate these people, you know, in terms of camps and so forth, Japanese camp, you know, Chinese camp. Now, Portuguese, uh, a lot of them came first, so a lot of them rose up in the hierarchy and became lunas or supervisors in the mm -hmm. field. But uh, I think the Chinese, I mean, with the Chinese, a lot of them uh, served their contract time and uh, they moved out mm -hmm. from the plantations. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, uh, they weren't being retained in the plantations initially. A lot of them started to move on and being entrepreneurial. And that's why they started to look at uh, the Japanese, bringing over the Japanese. And then, uh, of course, in the U.S. in 1882, they had the Chinese Exclusion Act. That's right, yeah. yeah. But that didn't apply to the Hawaiian Kingdom, but still, that stopped the flow of you know Chinese going to the mainland U.S. And um, I think the plantation owners found that the um, uh, Chinese were more ready to move out of the plantations, mm -hmm. you know, than stay in the mm -hmm. plantations. So as a result, 
I don't think as far as relationship between the two, I guess a lot of it was just segregated and these ethnic groups moved in, uh, you know, in separate paths, even though all of them might have worked at the plantations. Uh, mm -hmm. Were the Japanese uh, plantation workers paid more uh, than the ja Chinese? From what I heard, no. the Chinese were, were paid just a few dollars a month. But no. here you're talking about 15. No, the, um, <laughs> well, the Portuguese and the Chinese came first. Okay, Chinese came in about uh, 1852 or so. So their wages were higher than the Japanese because the Japanese oh, came later. Oh, the reverse. Later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, in 1909, when the first uh, only Japanese strike occurred, you know, on the Oahu of the plantations, they were asking for equal pay because everyone was doing the same work. When they were out in the fields, you know, they were, they were, they were not Japanese. They were, you know, Japanese, Chinese, Portuguese, all working in the same field, same That's time. Right, yeah. And the Chinese were getting paid $22. Oh. 2250 and the, the um, Japanese were getting paid 18. Uh huh. So their argument was that you know we're doing the same work, we should get the same pay. That that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But again, at that time there were no uh, laws protecting labor. But you're saying the Japanese stayed longer on the plantation than than well, the Chinese. Well, the experience the yeah, showed that. Yeah. Okay. Ended, they ended up. I mean, I'm sure we had people who, after their contract was done, they moved out, you know, but again, there were a lot more uh, Japanese than Chinese uh, as far as uh, immigration. You know. that, that's right. Yeah. Um, so we're going to take a quick break, okay. and uh, this is Asia in Review, and uh, we've been talking about the Japanese in Hawaii, and when we come back, we have more of the story. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. On Wednesday, September 4th, we have an interesting show with Donna Blanchard. She's the host of Arts in Hawaii, uh, 2 to 3 p.m. that day. And her guest is Jeff Gear. He's an international storyteller, and he tells stories about Hawaii. So check it out on ThinkTech, uh, September 4th, 2 to 3 p.m. I'm Jay Fidel. I'll see you there. Mahalo. I'm David Day, the host of Asian Review. This is a ThinkTech program in which we take the issues of the Asia-Pacific region, whether they be in business, in foreign policy, in national security, or geopolitics. And we take those issues and we try to probe down in some real depth. Maybe it's not always politically correct, but we get to the truth. We do things that the regular media can't do. And the reason that we can do those things is because we here at ThinkTech have the contacts. We have the network. And we can take the time and explore the issues in depth. Tune in every Thursday at 4 p.m. here at ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm David Day. The host we're back, we're live, and uh, this is Asia in Review, and I'm your host, Hong Jiang. And we've been talking with uh, John Akutani and Derek Iwata from the Japanese Cultural Center about uh, Japanese in Hawaii. So um, we were just talking about uh, the different waves of uh, Japanese immigration, and one more question I want to ask is, uh, um, what do you think was the reasons for the Japanese uh, immigrants to stay on the plantation longer than the Chinese? Well, again... Uh, Even though they were kind of paid a little less, right? Yeah, but still, again, just based on numbers, you know, mm -hmm. and just, and then... Uh, Culturally, is there any reason, or economically there are reasons? Well, I'm not too sure, I mean, if... It's just a curious question. Yeah. yeah. That's a very good question. <laughs> um, I know the Chinese tend to go on um, commerce as soon as they got right. the opportunity. To do so. Yeah, yeah. That, I, I mean, I again, the Japanese did just so, but then you're talking about uh, roughly 218,000, you know, immigrating to Hawaii. Japanese. Maybe the numbers won't be yeah. lost, therefore so, those who stayed out yeah. will some more. You know, we can just give uh, examples of the general experience, but mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure, I mean, there are a lot of them that moved out, especially during the uh, free immigration period, 1900s and 1907. When they moved out, what did they do? A lot of them went to establish their own business, you know, whether it be barber shops or work for companies out in the cities. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what they did eventually is uh, raise their um, social economic status because it's very difficult to work on the plantations and get ahead economically, you know, and even socially, because you're, you're all clustered into one same group, That's as right. opposed to being out in the community where you can meet people and, you know, interact and do things. And so that's what happened it's essentially from 1900 uh, on, I'm sure there's some before that, but 1900 on, these people started to be um, um, 
visible in the community and uh, raising their own uh, social economic status. You know. And that uh, impacts on, uh, you get to the subject of World War II because uh, these relationships were very important as far as the internment. Yeah, let's talk about the internment. Okay. The, um, I forgot at the beginning, but the beginning, I mentioned usually when I take tours through uh, Oscar Hanlon, who was a very uh, Pulitzer Prize historian, and he studied uh, immigration uh, to the U.S. Uh, for over five decades. But he noticed that no matter what ethnic groups, be it Japanese, European, Chinese, and Korean, that essentially that these groups went through a process, a uh, three-step process. First, uh, wrenching hardship. Secondly, uh, alienation or discrimination, you know, either personal or uh, institutional. And then finally, gradual Americanization. So when you look at the Japanese uh, experience in Hawaii, the apex for alienation or discrimination came on December 7th, 1941. Mm -hmm. Because then all things Japanese were taboo. You know, as far as, uh, uh, it's almost, uh, to me, when I look at it, you know, it's almost like a cultural ethnic cleansing. Because uh, if you're Japanese at that time, I mean, you're, uh, looked down upon, you're uh, called enemy aliens, even though you were a citizen of the U.S. I mean, totally, just based on the uh, uh, war hysteria. Mm -hmm. So uh, so from our view, or uh, the apex of our discrimination in the, as far as the Japanese experience in Hawaii is, is December 7th, 1941. And uh, on that day, the military and the FBI already had lists of people to pick up in the Japanese community. Oh, how did they identify these people? Just based on race. But there are so many of them. Yes, but these people were like the leaders of the community. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Priests and uh, Japanese language school teachers. Oh, I see. Principals. Japanese principals. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, their suspicion was that, uh, if you go back a little bit in the 30s, 1930s, when uh, Imperial Japan was uh, moving to China and so forth and being very aggressive, all they knew that you had about 157,000 Japanese here. And so that connection, only connection was that uh, must be some of them would be, uh, you know, fight for Japan or do something against us. But in the end, uh, uh, there was no uh, charges or anything for anyone as far as uh, who were here in Hawaii. So what they did was they built these lists of, of people in the community. So immediately uh, on December 7th, on December 8th, they picked up about roughly about 350 to 390 individuals wow. here in Hawaii. Uh, and again, just based on suspicion, would, no acts of sabotage or anything of that nature. Were these people and their families? Just the... Or, uh, or just the individuals? Yes, yeah, just the individuals. Were they removed and put in a, a concentration area? Well, again, initially uh, San Island, mm -hmm. yeah, immigration station in San Island. They were, they were put. That, that was until um, San Island, until, and then from San Island, uh, eventually some of them would be shipped out to the uh, camps on the mainland. Mm -hmm. Now, the Hawaii experience is a little bit different because, uh, first of all, on December 7th, uh, martial law, you know, took over. So based on martial law, they could pick these people up without any charges or anything like that. I see. Yeah, whereas on the mainland, uh, they had to wait till uh, President Roosevelt signed his executive order, which was February of 1942. And he signed the order that uh, until they, you know to move people out to these camps. But in a way, it's, it began immediately. Um, do you have numbers in terms of how, how many people were affected, and uh, more about their experiences? We don't have any accurate numbers, but roughly uh, the estimates are between 1,300 to 1,500 uh, people who were arrested. Attorneys. Now, there's some other factors involved in terms of uh, family members, because uh, initially, when a lot of these in, uh, internees from Hawaii were shipped out to mainland camps, some of the um, uh, mothers uh, wanted the family to be together. You know, they they didn't want to be separated. That's right. Here in Hawaii. So both men and women were picked up. No, they weren't. No, no. well. When these people were picked up, they were arrested, but then the family uh, people, they wanted to be together, so they vol quote, voluntarily, oh, voluntarily go on. Go oh, on. oh, I see. So you have a lot, roughly about 900 of these uh, family members 
joining their, um, you know, uh, father or whoever at these camps on the mainland. And so, um, and in effect, you know, they, they're going through the same process. They're at the internment camp and they're going through the same process, even though they were not arrested. Okay. But they just wanted to be together as a family. I see. Yeah. Um, do you know, uh, or have you spoken with anybody uh, who know uh, the uh, Japanese who have been in the internment camps here in Hawaii? Well, uh, there were several books that were uh, written mm -hmm. and translated. And then the uh, first one is um, The Light Behind Bob Wire and You Gotta Help Me Here. Yeah. Yeah. That was uh, Soga's book. Yeah. And he wrote about his internment. And then the other one was. Uh, um, Takichi Ozaki. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm at loss right now, but. That, that's okay. I'm sure yeah. people, can, people yeah. can check uh, the website of a Japanese cultural yeah, center and find out. He was from the Big Island and he was picked up on December 7th. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, Mrs. Ozaki was so determined to reunite with his, uh, with her, him that, uh, in 1944, they finally reunited in Jerome, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's the book that was written, uh, published recently. That must be really, really hard uh, experience for the Japanese, uh, even though not everybody uh, okay. were, uh, you know, route, routed into the uh, internment camp, but, uh, uh, you know, people feel discriminated against. There must right. be a lot of fear in the community then, right? Yes, I, I think it's, um, when you look at the Hawaii experience, of course, in the mainland, they all moved out. So, you know, the whole communities moved out into camps. So, but here it was very uh, selective. So, um, we have what we call uh, shunning. In other words, if you're living in this neighborhood and you see your neighbor get picked up and you're Japanese, then your thinking is, well, I shouldn't associate with that neighbor anymore. Oh, Otherwise, uh, I might be picked up. Okay, okay. Or they must have done something wrong because, you know, they're being picked oh. up and not me. Because nobody uh, is there to explain, you know, while we're picking up uh, newspaper people and all that. They just know that people are being picked up. I see. So there's some shunning going on. Mm -hmm. And there's some individuals that uh, were brave enough to, to keep on visiting these families. Because you have uh, a wife and maybe small children that's left alone, no income, wow. you know. So there's a big impact on them. And then uh, to have people shun them, I mean, which is... I guess it's kind of a natural thing, but we always tell the uh, groups that we uh, come through there, you know, that you have to think about what would you do if you were in that situation, you know? Would you shun or would you go over there and still help these people, mm -hmm. even though, you know, there's a threat over your head to be picked up also. So, so in addition to, like, Japanese shunning other Japanese who were picked up, right. uh, there, what about uh, other groups like uh, you know the, the uh, uh, other ethnic group uh, people from the other ethnic groups probably uh, also had to feel feel that they had to shun away from uh, the Japanese yeah. right no, we don't have any I mean you know documented evidence but they, they, you know they probably had you know people who were like that but then uh, a lot of the stories we have about uh, you know like the Chinese and Koreans and so forth they, yeah. they're very supportive of the they're, because they're friends, uh -huh. you know? But, and they knew that ethically they were different and that's the only reason why mm -hmm. their friends were being picked up. Um, in comparison, um, given that uh, the, the Japanese Im immigrants have been here for a long time and uh, have had a good relationship with uh, other people in here, do you think uh, the Japanese have had a less, uh, not as hard uh, experience during the internment compared to the mainland? Oh, or just, it's just the same? Well, it, it's not the same for those who were picked up. That, that's right, yeah. You but know. in terms of number, less yeah. were picked up here. Yes, yes. in terms okay. of numbers. But mm -hmm. again, and in general, I would say, because like my own parents, they were not uh, of, uh, impacted at all, other than uh, they had to turn their radio in to for demilitarization. Because mm -hmm. they were, you know, radios were only allowed to receive, but not, you know, transmit and all that. But that's the only thing that, impacted on them, but I get back to the point also that, uh, you know, from 1900 or so, when these people started to move up social and economically and establish these relationships, you had a lot of people in Hawaii, chief of the FBI, for example, who would vouch for people to say that 
No, he's a loyal American, you know? He wouldn't do anything, you know, against America. I mean, his housekeeper was Japanese. And then uh, my father was a sign painter. Uh, he used to paint signs for uh, John Burns when, uh, when he was uh, selling real estate. So this was way back before he even uh, became a police officer or worked for the police department. And during the war, he was the con part of the contact group. Now, I'm not, I don't have anything that says that he vouched for my parents, but mm -hmm. yeah, you know, nothing happened to them, you see. But it's, it's these relationships that were built up that you didn't have on the mainland, because on the mainland, if you look at the uh, demographics, 120,000 uh, internees were moved out to camps. And that represented less than 1% uh, of the population on the West Coast. So they didn't have these, uh, you know, like these close relationships that were built out, or, and they were like spread out all over. So they didn't have uh, this, uh, I would say, civilian political backing, you know, to counteract the military governor, you know, who was in charge at that time. Um, do you think part of that was uh, the number of uh, Japanese immigrants and also length of immigration and length of uh, uh, kind of uh, assimilation, uh, micronization? You mean uh, uh, the, the, the the fact that there's uh, there's these differences between Hawaii and the mainland U.S. Well, no. The main reason is because of the military governors who are in charge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the um, military governor here was very uh, more practical, and okay. he, in a sense that and and he had these people uh, uh, on his uh, team, so to speak, that would vouch for the Japanese, mm -hmm. and uh, he said. To move 157,000 people out from here, it would, he would lose his labor force, no structure, you know, he'd have to build that back up. So in a way that the number, large number of Japanese did make a difference Concentrated, in, yeah. in thinking. And then we were under martial law, so mm -hmm. in effect this whole island is where you couldn't move from island to island without permission, so it's like a big uh, internment camp by itself. That's yeah. right, yeah. And, um, but again, one of the biggest things is the relationships. On the mainland, the uh, military governor has just proven and some of the statements that he made was very, very anti-Japanese. As far as he was concerned, it didn't matter if they were first, second, or third Japanese. Mm -hmm. You know, they were they were Japanese as far as he was concerned. I use a more derogatory term, but then, um, so his his idea was that once you get had the executive order, which which didn't say pick up Japanese or German Americans or whatever, it just said anybody who was a threat to the defense of the uh, nation or defense of the country. Mm -hmm. put in these camps and in his idea it was all these Japanese mm -hmm. 120,000 of them. Wow, yeah, wow. that's it that's amazing. Yes. Um, we're going to take a, a short break and I'm Hong Jiang and this is Asia in Review <coughs> and we've been talking about Japanese in Hawaii. When we come back we'll have more of the story. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii broadcasting live from the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. We raise public awareness about tech energy and globalism in Hawaii. Technology is critical to our state. A vibrant tech sector will give us new prospects in the global marketplace and will offer great careers and make our economy more resilient. Streaming live on Ustream and Spreaker, ThinkTech allows its hosts and guests invaluable opportunities to report important events and discuss important questions and to be heard here in Hawaii and around the world. You can find links to our live streams on thinktechhawaii.com or on our mobile website, m.thinktechhawaii.com. And you can see our archive on YouTube. It's all just a click away. We want to do whatever we can to keep Hawaii relevant, connected, and thriving in the complexity of the 21st century. We hope you will help us in those efforts. Tune in today. This is ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo. Hello, we're back. We're live. This is Asia in Review, and I'm your host, Hong Jiang. And uh, we've been talking with uh, John Alkutani and uh, Derek Iwata. Now I get your last name <laughs> <Yeah>. right. <laughs> Derek Iwata, um, about uh, Japanese in Hawaii. So uh, we were talking about the internment. Uh, now, you know, how many, many years have, have passed? Uh, now over 60 years, uh, 70 years have passed. Um, how are Japanese feeling now about the internment? Well, again, um, a lot of them don't know about the internment. Oh, that's after 1945, when the camps closed down, and of course, during um, I'm talking about Honolulu Uli primarily, which is the biggest internment camp here, which was opened in uh, 1943 and then uh, 
until 1945 or so. Uh, when they uh, closed down and shut down, uh, it was a very uh, top secret uh, camp. Nobody knew about it. People had suspicions about it, you know, during the war and the, everything else, but nobody knew about it. And then it was uh, uh, forgotten from 1945 on. And the people who stayed at the internment camp either were uh, um, angry, you know, but they wouldn't talk about it too much. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, it, it'll uh, bring up some uh, bad feelings. So a lot of them did not talk about their internment experience. That, that's interesting. Maybe, maybe some of them were ashamed, you know. It's mm -hmm. just, uh, it was just part of the Japanese culture. Um, yeah. what, what about what about their children? You know, we hear a lot about the Nazis uh, that uh, who uh, they don't want to talk about it. But then later on, their children wanted to learn more about it and feel ashamed that their parents were involved. So uh, are there? You know, this is a totally different story on the other side of the Japanese story. Well, but are their children um, in any way involved in Derek? Well, yeah, that's a good question because um, when I was growing up. You know, I really didn't know anything about the war and started learning about it in school. And when I asked my grandmother about what was life like during the war, she was very adamant. She did not want to talk about it. Um, I know that no one in our family was sent into an internment camp, yet um, it was, I guess, a, a dark part of history that she did not want to go and relive. And so, um, even to this day, she won't talk about it. And so, you know, for my family, we didn't even know anything um, about what was going on, and we still don't know, you know, like what life was like for our family members huh. growing up here in Hawaii, uh, especially for her, um, you know, what it was like for her growing up. So basically, the story ended there. Uh, with, with the experience uh, well, that, that people just didn't want to talk about uh, I'm sure, well you talk about some of the books written maybe some people were mm -hmm. talking about it right well this is where we get into where how the uh, Japanese Cultural Center got involved with the Honolulu Honolulu internment camp and uh, it was back in uh, 1998 when uh, this one of the TV stations came to the Japanese Cultural Center and uh, at that time, Shinra's List was very, uh, you know, popular. Yeah, that's about the Holocaust in uh, uh, Europe. But they came and asked, inquired about Honolulu Uli internment camp here in Hawaii, and, and nobody had a clue as to what or where or you know who this place was. And as a result of that inquiry, a lot of the folks at that time, and some of them are still with us, and thank goodness for their uh, persistence decided to say, hey, we have something here that's important, you know, as far as relating to the Japanese Culture Center and Hawaii, and uh, we need to pursue this. So it took them a while from uh, 1998 to 2002, after, you know, telephone inquiries and uh, doing all these things, uh, that they finally located the camp. Hmm. Wow. Out, out in Eva. And this is yeah. not that many years later, that that, yeah. that history was obliviated yeah. almost. And uh, I guess uh, one of the things uh, things that were confusing is because if you, again, go back to Hawaiian history, Honouli Uli is a Aupua or a land division from Waihewa to uh, Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. So you have places within that land division called Honouli Uli. So it, it just so happened that this was a Honouli Uli gouge that was isolated, you know, away from the community that they eventually found the uh, site. And then since 2002, uh, based on grants and so forth, and uh, archaeological digs, and Derek, you know, participated in some of those, that uh, uh, we're conducting a more of an awareness campaign, you know, to let people know because a lot of people don't know about the camp. So the physical camp basically disappeared already, right? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but. All what's, what's left are these uh, slabs, some of the slab structures. Foundations of the buildings. Wow. Uh, foundations and so forth. And so, and right now we're just in a, we did uh, about uh, five, five or six public tours, yeah. you know, and uh, all these are based in the grants, so the grants have run out, but uh, we're still uh, pursuing more public tours, uh, maybe as a pay-as-you-go basis, but we're, we're keeping this uh, visible and you know up front because eventually the goal is to have the National Park Service take over the site 
and the landowner, landowner is willing to you know, donate the site uh, to the National Park Service once they get their approval and then, and then uh, we turn that into some sort of a memorial uh, for the internment camp and, and also an education center uh, for future generations to learn about you know, the experience and how uh, uh, discrimination and prejudice played a lot, a big role in it. That's right. So, um, would you say that uh, uh, the young generation were mostly unaware, young Japanese Americans here were unaware of that history of uh, internment, and the uh, older people didn't want to talk about it. So, it's almost like having no, not much practical impact today on the Japanese feelings about being here in the U.S. Is that accurate? Well, even the older generations did not know about it. The older generation. Yeah, so as soon as this passed, that they yeah, kind of. Yeah, because you're talking about roughly, it. you know, two thousand some people affected out of one hundred fifty-seven thousand. Yeah, very yeah, small yeah. percentage was mm -hmm. actually taken to internment camps. So mm -hmm. that's right. If yeah. you didn't, if you weren't one of those taken, or a family member who went to visit, you wouldn't know where it was. That's interesting. Because my yeah, my mom was uh, ninety-seven. I asked her, and she says she didn't know have any clue about the camp. Mm -hmm. um, my family, we live in Village Park, which is almost like a, not a hop, skip, and a jump, but it's very close by to where the camp is located now. And we had no idea where the internment camp was. And now that I know, it's like, whoa, we live like almost across the street. <laughs> That's interesting. So um, bring that to the topic of uh, uh, Japanese culture. And, uh, you know, of course, this uh, history of internment is part of the Japanese identity and history here in the U.S. and in Hawaii. Uh, what about uh, other aspects of uh, cultural preservation? I know you talk about the language. Uh, Japanese language is basically uh, no, no more. And uh, uh, what about uh, other ways? We just have a few, uh, maybe two minutes to talk about, uh, or less than two minutes, one minute to talk about uh, um, <laughs> well, cultural maintenance and uh, what are still there. Yeah. Well, there um, things, well, here at the Cultural Center, we do take tours through our exhibition. The people do learn about the immigration, but we also teach the children to come through some of the culture aspects that are still um, practiced today. Maneki Neko, the Good Luck Cat, or the Dharma. But we also do um, like folk dances with the kids, which is part of the Bon season. Um, we're actually in ending of the Bon season now uh, here in Hawaii. And so these are aspects that the Japanese brought when they came as immigrants, and they pass on to their children and their children's children. And so you know we are also continuing continuing that tradition of teaching children about Japanese culture and traditions at the cultural center. Um, so for the audience out there, if you want to learn more about Japanese immigration history and culture, you can visit uh, the, the Japanese Cultural Center. There, uh, I'm sure there is a very uh, big presence on the website. Yes, so you can um, visit our website um, at www.jcdh.com. Um, and uh, and if you you're interested in a tour, you know, there's a little section there you can book tours. <laughs> And John um, Akutani is uh, the tour guide there uh, to the help you. Guys. We have a lot. Yeah. O okay. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, we're out of time and uh, we have to wrap up. And I'm Hong Jiang, and this is Asia in Review. And uh, we've been uh, learning about Japanese in Hawaii, and uh, we've been talking with uh, John Akutani, Akutani, and Derek Itawa. Iwata, sorry, <laughs> uh, from Japanese Cultural Center. And thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for thank having us. Yeah. And um, I'm Hong Jiang, and this is Asia in Review. And I'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>